Good morning. Good morning. And uh, welcome here to Calvary Lutheran Church on this uh, humid Midwestern July day as we come together to worship uh, our God in spirit and truth. And we come, of course, to worship uh, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And welcome to those of us who are joining us uh, on our live streaming service this morning or even in our parking lot. We still continue to have uh, those three services that are available depending on your uh, comfort level right now with everything that is going on in the world. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that our pyramids remain red. Uh, that is not because of the 4th of July, uh, although maybe it's a bit of a happy coincidence in that sense. Uh, those are uh, still up there from confirmation last week. We typically don't have confirmation in the fourth week and in June, obviously, so we uh, didn't get those switched out, but I do, I do like to think of it as a reminder to continue to pray for our confirmands. Uh, I challenge everyone to pray for them by name this last week, and so uh, the fact that the pyramids remain red this week is kind of a happy coincidence uh, as a reminder to continue praying for them as they take their faith into the world. And just a reminder uh, of their names, Bree, Madeline, Parker, Matthew, James, Briar, Braden, Micah, and Casey. So continue to pray for them this week as they have that uh, difficult job of going into high school, going into college in the future, into a world that is hostile to Christ, uh, and staying true to what they have confessed at their confirmation. Uh, we have a fair amount of prayer requests uh, this week and a few announcements we'll all just ask before we begin. Uh, any prayer requests um, that anyone has this morning? Uh, if not, I'll announce a few. Keep uh, Craig Mary in your prayers. We've obviously been praying for Craig since he had surgery, I guess, about a week and a half ago it's been. And the, uh, the surgery was extremely complicated. Uh, I think four of his organs had fused together, and so he is um, still recovering, and it's just a long kind of road for Craig. So uh, keep Craig in your prayers, and of course, also keep Gloria in your prayers during the strange time she hasn't been able to see him, uh, of course, since the surgery and getting to the hospital and all of those things. So uh, keep the Marys in your prayers. Uh, keep Jan Moore in your prayers. This Tuesday, she is going to have uh, a hip replacement surgery. So that's this Tuesday uh, for Jan here in town having surgery. Uh, we also want to pray for um, the Kales and, and the passing of Kim's mother, Claris. What's her name, right? Um, so we're going to pray for the Kale family uh, as well. And the last announcement I have is um, a prayer of celebration, really, uh, for Francis Florkey. Um, celebrating her 100th birthday on uh, July 11th. What a milestone. Francis is down at um, Pioneer Village and Sergeant Brupp. I love Francis because she's pretty spunky when I was back here, uh, especially for her age when I was here last summer. Uh, I, of course, didn't know uh, any of our shut-ins very well, and I went in to go visit her, and I had my, uh, I had my clerical on, and she said, no thanks, I already have a minister. Um, so... <laughs> I had to try and tell her that, you know, though she didn't know me, I was in fact her minister. Uh, unbeknownst to her, maybe she didn't want me there at that point, but uh, uh, no, we had a fine conversation after that. She has lots of, uh, lots of vigor for her age. Um, so, it's, uh, so we praise God for her uh, and her 100th birthday coming up uh, this week. Uh, last announcement, we still have time to register for VBS. So um, we're very excited about VBS, even though we have to do it online. Uh, one more opportunity during this strange year for uh, parents to really help their kids learn in the faith and have a good opportunity to have those faith conversations with their kid about um, Jesus' power pulling us through life and Jesus' power carrying us through those difficult times of life. So we've extended the deadline to register until this Wednesday, the 8th. Uh, if you have anybody you know who would like uh, to sign up for VBS, please uh, tell them to go ahead and sign up on our website, calvaryleads.com. Um, that will contain everything they need to, to register. Any other prayer requests or announcements this morning? Well, with that, uh, even though it's uh, Independence Day, we're going to, of course, celebrate that uh, though we live in a democratic republic, we know that the greater reality is that we have a, a heavenly king who watches over us, regardless of what earthly government we are under. And so we begin our opening hymn, hymn 905, Come Thou Almighty King.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, lead us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Lord and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We read our intuit responsibly. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious Lord,
be with you. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, your mercy attends us all our days. Be our strength and support amid the wearisome changes of this world, and at life's end, grant us your promised rest in the full joys of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our reading. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading and also the basis for my message this morning is from the book of Romans, the seventh chapter. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, to, but what I, hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand in honor of the Holy Gospel. Because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by the Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. This time, having heard the Gospel of our Lord, we confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. 
I believe in one God, God in the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord of Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not of me, being of one substance to the Father, I do all things for me, who cross men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under conscious power. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. Now I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And now I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism of the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead, and life of the world to come. Amen. This time you may be seated for our children's message, although I don't see uh, any kiddos here except for Creed. We'll go ahead and have one in case anybody's watching on our live stream this morning. Uh, so did anybody uh, shoot off any fireworks last night? Nobody shot off any fireworks here. Okay, the Torgersons did, all right. Uh, and you, may, you probably know, what time are you supposed to uh, be done shooting off fireworks? Midnight, was it 11? I, I, thought, I thought I read it was 11. It probably doesn't matter where you guys live, maybe. Uh, I thought it was 11 that the law said that you were allowed for these uh, two days, July 3rd and 4th, I think, to shoot fireworks until 11. <laughs> now, of course, that's out the window. I've been hearing fireworks for weeks. Uh, I'm sure you all have too. And uh, did it stop at 11 in anybody's neighborhood? No, of course not, right? Uh, I heard fireworks, I think, all the way until 11.45 and I finally got to sleep. Uh, they kept my daughter awake and she was very excited, of course, and she kept saying high work because she quite, can't quite say fire, so she kept saying high work and wouldn't go to sleep. Uh, but the law says, uh, the law says that the fireworks are supposed to be done at 11. Now, in some ways, that's a pretty trivial law. It's not all that important, right? Uh, but in other ways, it is kind of an important law so that people can get to sleep uh, at a decent time, especially uh, when July 4th lands on a Saturday uh, and people are supposed to be getting up and going to church anyway. We know that doesn't always happen. Uh, but it's an important law, and it's not always kept. But the point that Paul makes in the very first statement of our reading today, that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, is that even if we kept the letter of the law, even if all of the fireworks ended right at 11 on the dot, we still wouldn't keep the spirit of the law, the heart of the law. That is God's law, especially as Jesus proclaimed it in something like the Sermon on the Mount where he says, You have heard it said, do not murder, but I say to you, whoever hates his brother in his heart is guilty of murder. That is, the law is aimed at our heart. Not even just if we stop the fireworks at 11, but if we wanted to keep going, if we were frustrated that the authorities said we had to stop at 11, all of these little things reveal the truth about each and every one of us that as sinners, even as Christians, we continue to carry this rebellious heart within us. This rebellious heart that so often wants to break laws, that desires not to love our neighbor, but to speak ill of our neighbor and all of these things. Uh, in our reading today, in our sermon, we're going to wrestle with what Paul talks about when he talks about wanting to do the good that he should do, but not being able to, not wanting to do the evil, but doing that anyway, and this internal struggle that he is having. But of course, his realization of his own sinfulness ultimately drives him more and more to Christ. Who can deliver me from this body of death? It's not me, it's not you. Only Jesus Christ in him crucified and risen for us can deliver you and I from the body of death. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, far too often, even as Christians, when we look inside, we see nothing but sin and death. Even, Lord, when we experience frailty, when we experience our body failing us, we know that we have failed so often to keep the law and that we must pay that ultimate punishment of death. And yet you, Lord, came that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Thank you for delivering us from this body of death and giving us this sure and certain hope of resurrection because of what you have done. Because on the third day, you rose victorious over death. And just as death did not hold you, so it will not hold us. We pray that you would keep us safe this week and empower us to share that message with others. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Of course, as we think about that theme, even uh, as Christians, how we are still burdened by our sin, we recognize we have nothing truly too good to offer God just on our own. It's the Holy Spirit at work within us. And so we confess that now in song, singing the hymn, Just As I Am, Without One Plea. If you've ever visited Manhattan, if you've ever been to New York City, there is a very good chance that you simply didn't notice it. When I took a trip to New York City a little over a decade ago after my senior year of high school, I had no idea that it was there. But since at least 1994 and its current iteration, a clear wire, a little like fishing line has existed, a wire that encircles much of Manhattan, creating a sort of barrier. You probably won't notice it unless you are deliberately looking for it and know where it is, but this wire has been meticulously maintained in one form or another in various sizes for about a hundred years. In fact, this wire running around Manhattan is monitored every single week to make sure there are no breaks in the line. Why does this wire exist? This clear fishing line that functions as a sort of fence around Manhattan. Well, consider for a moment. Suppose that you are an Orthodox Jew and you observe the Sabbath day Rigorously, that third commandment as we number them, to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. If you are an observant Orthodox Jew and you desire to keep the Sabbath holy, what that means today, how that tradition has developed, means, of course, that on the Sabbath, you are not allowed to do any work. But not just get in your car and drive to the office and find an extra hour or two to do some work or perhaps do some work from home as so many are doing, but you are not allowed to do anything including physical work. In the law, there is a tradition, a prohibition against carrying anything on the Sabbath. You are not allowed to carry anything outside of your house, car keys, a wallet, even your child. So you can imagine that if you are not allowed to carry anything, truly observing the Sabbath really means that you cannot leave your house. Well, the rabbis realized how difficult this prohibition against carrying is, so they created a sort of sacred space in which it is permissible to carry. 
And this wire that encircles so much of Manhattan, so much of that main borough in New York City, known as an A-Ruv, E-R-U-V, creates a kind of domestic space within which it is permissible for Orthodox Jews to carry things on the Sabbath, even push a baby stroller. What this wire does is it symbolically turns a public space into a private and domestic space for all Orthodox Jews. In fact, many cities have these wires or fences that run around parts of the city. There's one in Washington, D.C., London, Atlanta, Minneapolis, even in St. Louis. And the seminary campus, as I was looking on the map, is actually within the bounds of the a roof of this boundary marker. And so especially in New York City, this a roof is meticulously maintained. They take this boundary very seriously. Any break in the line would void the entire boundary. So in New York and Manhattan, every Thursday, a rabbi drives the entire length of the a roof, the entire length of the wire, to make sure there are no breaks in the line. And if there is a break, if he finds a problem, he calls in a construction company who brings in a cherry picker to fix the line. You can imagine paying the rabbi, paying the construction company. This incurs a cost. In fact, in New York, nearly $150,000 to $200,000 a year is spent maintaining this error. It might seem strange as we celebrate the 4th of July this week, <coughs> as, we, as we recognize many of the freedoms that we do have in this country, to discuss this boundary, this limit which many Orthodox Jews observe. But this concept of the Eruv, this limit in which you can carry things as an Orthodox Jew and still observe the Sabbath, this concept illustrates our very human approach to the law. And of course, not just God's law, such as the Ten Commandments, in this case, the third commandment, that you should remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy, but any human law. You see, we often conceive of the law or any, any human laws as only affecting our outward actions. If you're on one side of the wire, you're keeping the law. But to cross to the other side of the arrow, that means that you have broken the law. So let's use an example a little closer to home. Perhaps we think that keeping the law regarding fireworks is a matter of making sure no fireworks are set off after 11. Or the matter of whether or not we are actually going 55 miles an hour in a 35 mile per hour zone. We think that they are only about outward action when really it's a matter of the heart. See, this arrow, this line that helps to ensure that Orthodox Jews don't break the Sabbath, cannot measure the heart. It can only determine whether or not your body has passed the marker. In our reading today, there is a debate about our text from the book of Romans. In this text, Paul is, is wrestling with himself. It's a text I'm sure you're familiar with, but it's always good to hear it again. And he is describing this inner struggle that he has. He recognizes the law of God, like this boundary marker, is good. A law such as remember the Sabbath is a good law designed for human flourishing. But his flesh, his heart, struggles to fulfill the law. And the debate over these verses in the scholarly community and among pastors is regarding the question of whether or not Paul is describing himself in these verses before his conversion, before his coming to Christ, or whether Paul is continuing to describe himself as a Christian. That even as a Christian, as one who follows Christ, he continues to struggle every day with his sin. 
with his desire to sin, with his rebellious heart, this sin that continues to dwell within him. Now, we don't really have time to weigh in on this debate, and so much ink has been spilled. And if you're interested in this question of whether or not Paul is describing himself before his conversion, or he's describing himself even in the midst of his Christian life, if you're interested in that question, please come talk to me. It's a very interesting question. But regardless of the answer to that question, what Paul realizes is that true obedience to the law is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of simply staying inside of a boundary marker for 24 hours of the week. It's not a matter of outwardly abstaining from certain foods or activities, though of course those things might be important, but it is rather, first and foremost, a desire, a matter of our desires, of our will, of our wishes and things that we think and want that we so often believe that we can keep hidden from everyone else. After all, it was Jesus who taught this view of the law in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount when he said this, You have heard it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Jesus also said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent in his heart has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. True obedience to the law is a matter of the heart. And Martin Luther realized the same thing. Here's what he says as he's writing an introduction to the entire book of Romans in 1522, nearly 500 years ago. He says this, God judges according to what is in the depths of the heart. For this reason, his law too makes its demand on the inmost heart. It cannot be satisfied with outward works, but rather punishes hypocrisy and lies and works not done from the bottom of the heart. So if we had a heart check today for you and I, even as Christians, how would we be doing? So if you and I are, are honest, if we examine not just our outer works, for example, not just whether or not we have crossed some sort of boundary marker, whether we have done something wrong in speech or in deed, but if we examine our hearts and even our thoughts, I know that we, like Paul, will so often find our hearts full of sin and death. See, with that debate, I really do believe that Paul is speaking here as a Christian, as one who follows Christ, because we know that even as Christians, we continue to struggle mightily with sin. We continue to have this old Adam, this law of sin that he described that is at work within us. And I have seen it these last several months, as I'm sure you have. I have seen Christians, I have seen men and women whom I respect, men and women whose faith I know firsthand. I have seen how Christians have been drawn into the ugly polarization of our current issues. I have seen it on the internet as Christians tear one another apart. I have seen Christians use their platform and their voice as followers of Christ not to build up, not to speak the truth in love, but rather to tear down, to abuse, to vilify those with whom they do not agree. But of course, it's bigger than what we see others do. Because whenever I rush to judgment, because I post virtually nothing on Facebook, but whenever I rush to judgment for somebody's misinformed or ill-timed comment, I see another law at work within myself. I see the same anger 
the same frustration, the same ability to sin dwelling within me. It is easy for me to judge somebody else. Whenever I begin to take that posture of judgment, of course, I'm reminded of my own heart. And like Paul, I too confess that really nothing good dwells within me. I have seen it. I have seen how so often I have hated my enemy in my heart, even if they are wrong. That I have not loved and prayed for my enemies as I should have. I have not loved and prayed for those who do not know Christ, even those who are hostile to the church of Christ. I have often held on to grudges instead of forgiving from the heart and praying for my neighbor. I have seen the sin in my own heart, especially these last couple of months, which have been so stressful for so many and have often pushed us to our limit. But I suspect that as Christians, that you have seen it as well. The Christian life, ironically, is often one in which we recognize to a greater and greater degree more of our own sin, sins of thought, word, and deed. Of course, we recognize, isn't it, that the sins of thought, those sins of the heart, are the most persistent. Those are the sins that are so resistant to any removal. It's not just a matter of doing the right thing with your body, of stopping short of the wire. It's about the heart. If you've been a Christian for 50 years or five minutes, you know this is true. That even the greatest Christian has more than enough sin within them to humble us to drive us each and every day toward Christ. We too can speak these words with Paul, wretched man or woman that we often are or we find ourselves to be. Who will deliver us from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel the gospel that Romans proclaims, that Paul proclaims. This good news about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, what Christ has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. The good news is that the gospel is for you and me as Christians. It is for us each and every day. This message is not only what brought us into the church, this gospel word attached to water and baptism, this saving name given to you and me, this name which alone can save us from this body of death, this message is what we need each and every day. Thinking of confirmation last week, it struck me how we never graduate from hearing about how Christ saves us from death. How Christ even delivers us from ourself. As we struggle with the frailty of our world, especially with the coronavirus. As we deal with that reality of death. And even as we turn to the sin in our own hearts. We need to hear this each and every day. That Christ alone saves us from sin and death. Only Christ and deliver us from ourselves. Only in Christ do we find our salvation. And he has given this free gift to you and to me. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ, who delivers us from ourselves. Amen. This time you have the opportunity to receive our offering. Of course, we're not uh, passing the plate as of yet, but you can drop your offering off uh, on your way out for communion as well. Uh, there's a few announcements I forgot to make this morning uh, in the rush of, of getting everything announced. Uh, Pastor Travis is, of course, not here, as you probably noticed uh, so far this morning. He has another procedure coming up on Tuesday in Omaha, which, of course, meant that he had to go through the whole uh, rigmarole of getting the coronavirus test on Saturday and then having to quarantine so he doesn't risk catching it uh, until his uh, procedure. 
Uh, so keep him in your prayers as he undergoes that uh, short procedure uh, on Tuesday, as well as keep Pastor Shoup in your prayers. He had surgery uh, about a week and a half ago now, and surgery went uh, very well, so he's on his road to recovery, so he should be, uh, should be doing well. Along with that, thanks to uh, Terry for playing uh, for us this morning and blessing us uh, with her music. It's great to uh, have live music uh, here this morning. Uh, just a quick uh, announcement, of course, about communion. I think most everybody has been here, uh, but we'll continue our practice, especially with cases rising across the country. Uh, during the offertory, I'll go and wash my hands. We'll have a mask and a face shield. Um, we'll invite one row up at a time, uh, kind of alternate rows. Use your best judgment as we don't have ushers as to when uh, to get up uh, on either side. Uh, after receiving the communion, after receiving the blessing, exit out either side of the chancel doors, uh, and then we'll gather in the parking lot and we'll sing the common doxology. Uh, if there is uh, anybody out in our parking lot service this morning, uh, after service, come around to the front, uh, come around to the front doors and I will commune you uh, in our sanctuary after everybody else uh, has left. Uh, with that, I invite you to stand as we uh, praise God and sing together our offertory. <laughs> Heavenly 
Father, we celebrate with Frances in her 100th birthday this week. And we thank and praise you for the long life that you have given to her. We pray that you would continue to shower your blessings upon her. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of baptism. That by baptism you have delivered us from this body of death and given us everlasting life. We celebrate with Mike, Jackie, Brittany, Cherie, Marsha, Thomas, Bob, Josh, Dylan, Ashley, and Carolyn. Bless them on the week of their baptismal birthday and remind them this day and every day of the gift that you have given them in baptism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Hi, I'm Pastor James Travis, and welcome to the organ bench of Calvary Lutheran Church. Today we're going to do a national hymn devotion, Star Spangled Banner, God Bless America, and a few others. Every Thursday we have a hymn devotion, although today we're doing a patriotic special for the 4th of July. I'd invite you to subscribe, and every Thursday we have a hymn devotion, and on Sunday we have live worship here on YouTube. I want to start, though, by sharing with you some hymns that I recorded up on the Calvary Lutheran Church organ. These hymns remind me of a greater time in our country, just like on the penny, and God we trust. God bless America, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But was there ever really a time when everybody worshipped God? I'm reminded of our beginning of our history that maybe these hymns that we sing weren't all addressed to the true God. We had deist. People like Jefferson Madison have been accused of being deist. Deism is a religion of nature that puts human reason over the Bible and God. And of course, if you're praying to that kind of God, you're not praying to the Trinity, to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, of course, others were Unitarian. They denied Jesus as even being God. Still others were Masons like the Elks Lodge or the Moose Lodge that still exists to this day. 
you might not realize that the Lodge never gives Jesus credit. Uh, many people go to the Lodge and they think they're worshiping Jesus, but if you look at their writings, he is never ever mentioned and deliberately on purpose. That way everybody from a Buddhist to a Jew to a Christian to a Unitarian can all get together. But does God like that? That we don't use his name? I think there's a commandment about that. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. In fact, God is jealous wanting us to call on his name. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God Yahweh. The God who says, I am, the one who says, I am the good shepherd, the one who is incarnate in Jesus Christ as our Savior. You see, when we sing, God bless America, who are we really talking to? When we sing the Star Spangled Banner, are we really praying to the true God, the one who has created this country, or are we praying to somebody else? We have to be very careful. I think we can learn a lot from the Apostle Paul who went to the Areopagus and spoke to the Greeks there. I want to read you how he handled this situation when he dealt with very religious people who worshipped an ongoing God. This is from Acts chapter 17. Paul then stood up in the meeting in the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at our objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And then Paul goes into and explains how the true God created the world and how it was Jesus who came to save and how he rose from the dead and he would raise us from the dead and I believe it's our obligation as Christians that we point this out to the deists to the Unitarians and even those that don't know who they are worshiping that the true God is Jesus Christ and so when we worship we worship and use some of these songs in our worship services but we have to be reminded that this God bless America this is Jesus himself, who is at work in the United States. Now, secondly, I want to deal with another problem that sometimes comes with patriotic hymns. I, I think it is wonderful to be patriotic, and I hope all of you celebrate the 4th of July that are in the United States, and give thanks to God for creating this country in which we live. But on the other hand, we need to be careful to recognize that God is the God of all countries. And so he created every single one of them. And so he wants the North Korean to be saved just as much as the Russian, just as much as the Chinese and those in the United States. And so, yes, we celebrate our country being under God. But we also pray that every country comes under the true God, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So... I hope you enjoyed our time together and maybe this gave you a new way to think about our patriotic hymns and hopefully when you sing them, don't just assume everyone around you is worshiping the true God, but I pray that you would worship the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as you ask God to bless America. Have a great week. Have a great celebration.